You may have watched my six-part series on making this triple laminate English longbow, thanks to those of you who did. Quite a few of you have asked for the series to be incorporated into one video, so here it is. Grab yourself the drink of your choice and maybe some popcorn, as we look at all six parts of how to make a longbow. Welcome to part one of a series of videos where we take a look at making this stave into a triple laminate longbow. And it consists of bamboo, pikia, and lemon wood on the belly. It's a square stave at the moment. We've marked out the center line there, the top of the handle, and the bottom of the handle. As I say, it's a square stave at the moment, so we need to get rid of those corners, which is the roughing out process. The first thing we're going to do is mark the top of the stave, which will hopefully give us a center line down the length of the belly of the bow, which will make roughing out that much easier. I'm just using a tape here to mark roughly the center of the stave. This isn't something I do anymore as I've been making bows for an awful long time, but it's something that I really do advise you do if you are making bows for the first time. And once you've completed those marks, you can join up all the dots. Do this down the rest of the stave and it will make your life a lot easier when you're actually doing the roughing out process. When you're going down the sides of the stave you'll find it really helps to know where the centre of the stave is, which meaning you're taking off equal amounts of wood either side of that stave, particularly if you're new to doing roughing out. You may find that you've lost some of the markings on the belly when you've been preparing this stave, so at this point it's a good idea to remark where that handle is on the belly, as that's the first area we're going to be working on. It's important to know where the handle is in this process, so you don't take off too much wood here or there, depending on how you're structuring the bow. As you can see from this end-on view, the stave is still very much a square section. Now to get that classic curved D section look of an English longbow, we're going to need to work on that belly. I'm going to use a spoke shave to do the majority of the work when we start the roughing out here by taking the corners off the belly section of the bow. If you find the wood picks up, you may need to reverse the direction that you're going with the tool and see if that creates less marks in the material. It's probably easier to see from this close-up of the handle section exactly the shape that I'm achieving by removing those corners with the spoke shave. I'm avoiding going any further than the centre laminate and that line we created on the belly. After that initial work with the spoke shave, you can now see we've got a nice steep curve. I'm going to mirror that as best I can on the opposite corner of the stave. Looking down the end of the stave now that we're done with the spoke shave, you can see that we have achieved that D section shape that we were looking for. So our belly is basically done as far as roughing out is concerned, now it's time to work on the back. I've already done some before working on the belly to get rid of the very sharp edge that you get on bamboo, which trust me, you don't want to be handling whilst doing the rest of this work. You don't have to get rid of the outer layer that you find on bamboo, but getting rid of this sort of outer waxy layer does reveal the bamboo and its nice stripes and colours that you get underneath. I'm starting by using a rasp to just carefully take off that outer layer, and being very careful when I get to the nodes. Those are those sort of raised lumps the join in the structure of the bamboo. Particularly when making an English longbow, we really would recommend leaving the nodes there, otherwise you risk making the backing of the bow weaker. Once you've got the worst off with the rasp, you can start using the file to get rid of those marks. And don't forget, it's not just the flat section of the backing that we're working on here, we want to blend in that corner, so we're making a nice 
curve, almost mirroring the work that we did on the belly, but with a much shallower depth. Once I finish with the file, I tend to finish things off with the cabinet scraper. It's good at removing any marks that may be left over in the back of the bow. In fact, it often leaves it smooth enough that you don't even need to do any sanding. On the left is the area where I've got rid of that backing and on the right it's still there. It just shows it really is worth getting rid of that and the finish that you can achieve. And much as we found at the beginning of this process, you may have lost some of the markings of the handle section from the back of the bow, the area that we've been working on. If you take your cue from the side there, you'll see that the markings are still there. So take the opportunity now to remark the handle. We're nearly at the tillering stage and one of the last checks you need to do is your width to depth ratios. Using the calipers here you can see that this stave is still a little bit too deep so I'll need to sort that out before getting it on the tiller. Because we don't have horns on the end of the bows yet, we're going to make some simple grooves straight into the wood. There we can sit our string ready to start tillering. Using a rat tail rasp I'm just making a groove around the end so we can use a bracing cord. The groove for the bracing cord doesn't need to sit at any particular angle. We'll be making a similar groove at the bottom of the bow to allow the bracing cord to sit into these two grooves, which will help us brace the bow more easily. I'll explain more about this bracing method in the second part of this series of videos. Don't forget to subscribe so you can be notified when that comes out. As this is the top of the bow and we'll be using a single loop laid in string, that top loop can come quite far down the bow, so the angle is quite acute. I recommend drawing on with a pencil much as I'm doing here, which will really help you get it accurately cut. Once I've finished with the rat tail rasp, much as before, I'll use a large round file to get rid of any marks and also widen up that gap a bit, ready to fit the string in. When I place the loop of the string on here, you can see why we had to cut that groove at such an acute angle. As the bow becomes more and more braced, it will sit better and better into that slot. Moving on to the bottom limb now, we don't need such an acute angle in this groove as it's going to only accommodate a bowyer's knot. In fact, the angle won't be too far off what we've done with the bracing cord. You may want to do a bit more work with the round file here to make this slot a bit wider to accommodate the knot as it's a slightly beefier part of the string. Well, we're basically ready to get this up onto the tiller, so that's what I'm going to do. Hello folks and welcome to part two of making this triple laminate longbow. If you missed part one, I'll put that on the screen and in the links below.
we're up to the point now where we're tillering. So we've already got the tillering grooves in, which we did in the last video, and we've got the string loosely placed onto the bow, and we've got the bow up on the tiller. I'm not expecting to see an awful lot at the moment because, well, as I say, we've only just put it up there, but I will give it a few tentative draws on the tiller and see what, uh, well, see what shape we're getting from the bow. Um, whether that's coming across on the video or not, but you can probably see we've actually got a bit of bend in the top limb around here. Don't know whether you can see that. And the bottom limb, well, it's not doing a lot at all. So I suspect what I need to do first is take some wood off that bottom limb. And uh, that top limb, I'll probably leave it alone for now. I might take a little bit out of here, just to even that up. Try and relieve some of that bend that we're getting in the top there. So I'm going to get that onto the workbench, even that up, and then we'll come back and see how that looks. By using the rasp I've taken some throughout that bottom limb and at the top limb I've taken some out around here and I've done a little general work to get rid of some of the rough tools from the roughing out that I did. Let's have a look now see how it looks. Okay, you can probably see we're still looking at a larger movement, a larger bend in that top limb. It's not as acute to one point as it was. The first time we drew that up, we were looking at more this sort of point here. Now it's a bit more general where I've taken some out. The bottom limb isn't still isn't doing too much, so I think what we'll do is we'll take this down and take a bit more out through that bottom limb. I won't touch the top at all and we'll see if we can even that up a bit and then draw it a bit more. We're back up onto the tiller so this is the third go at tillering. I have taken some more out of that bottom limb that's basically all I've concentrated on. Let's see if that's made any difference when I pull it now. Okay, we're starting to get some movement in that bottom limb now. Okay, I've just realised the camera might be over slightly to one side. I'm going to move it over, that might even things up a bit how it looks on the screen. Okay, I've moved the camera a bit. I'm not sure it's making any difference, but I just I didn't want things to look too incorrect uh, when I look back at this on the footage. Um, yeah, I think that looks a bit more even now. Okay, let's give that a few more pulls. Okay, yeah, we are getting a bit more movement in that limb now. Okay, so we're probably getting more movement in this 
section of this limb. So I probably want to take a bit out through, probably through here, perhaps even that up. And the top limb. It's certainly looking stiff at the very tip. And there's a bit of a stiff section around here. So I'll have a look at those. Right, we've got it back up on the tiller again. Let's see what we got now. Okay, we've still got more bend in that top limb. Ultimately, we do want a bit more bend in that top limb because of the way these types of bows are and the way they're structured and the length of that top limb. But that's too much at the moment. Another good indicator is actually the travel of the hook here. You're seeing it's moving over to one side as we draw it down. That um, bottom limb looks to be stiff across here. You notice the tip to mid limb isn't doing much. Anyway, we'll take a bit more out of that and uh, see what happens. I've taken some off the bottom. Let's see if that's made any difference now. Okay, that's looking a bit better. I think what we'll do is brace the bow up a little bit and uh, get it back on the tiller. As you can see, I've braced it up a bit. It's probably an inch, um, inch and a half off full bracing height. Anyway, we're going to draw that up and see how it looks now. Okay, that's not looking too bad. I think what I'll do is get it up to full bracing height and then take some measurements and go from there. We're at full bracing height now. Um, I've actually done some measurements going out from the center of the handle to approximately sort of eight, in eight inches along the limb and then measuring down to the string. Done that both sides. We want about a two eighths inch difference between the limbs ultimately this because the top limb is longer so we want that to be about two eighths of an inch deeper 
than the bottom limb. The bottom limb actually is still a touch stiff going by the measurements. Um, but now we're at full bracing height, we can hopefully see a bit easier uh, whether we've got where we've got stiff spots and what have you. Let's let's draw it up and have a look. In general it's not looking too bad but there are a few areas that we can work on here. The bottom limb as I say is the one that's actually a bit too stiff at the moment. The areas it seems to be stiff is actually sort of here in the handle section. If you compare it to the top here there's not a lot happening sort of oops from around there to there. It's a bit stiff. The tips are a bit stiff on both limbs, but I tend to leave those a bit stiff because when we put the knocks on here and here, we're obviously going to reduce the end of the bow to actually meet the knock. So we tend to lose some of that stiffness. So I tend to leave that. If you've seen any of the other videos I do on tillering, um, you'll, you'll notice that I've done that before. The top limb here, we've actually got a slight stiff section just around there. And you can see that on the camera. So we're going to need to do something about that as well. Okay, let's work on those areas and see how it looks next. Well, let's see where we are now. We've taken some more wood out of those areas that I just mentioned. So it's not looking too bad now actually, it's a bit more of an even bend there going on. I'll do obviously some measurements and double check how that actually looks when I get the ruler on it. There's one or two areas I could fiddle around with, but obviously I'm going to need to get this bow to a certain weight. So what I'm going to do first is get the knocks on, which will mean, as I mentioned earlier on, taking down some of the thickness of these tips which will make those bend a bit more which will change the overall look and shape of the bow so there's not much point me fiddling around too much more now until i've got those on so join me in the next video um, where we'll get the knocks on and we'll also then have a look at how the tiller is and see what shape see whether it's changed compared to what it is now and working towards finishing the tillering aspect of the bow Okay, I hope that was useful. As I say, if you missed part one, I'll put that in the links below. And please do subscribe and like and all those other things so you can join me on part three of this series of build along videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon. Welcome to part 3 of making a longbow. This time we fit and carve the horn knocks. I've chosen cow horn as hopefully that will give us some interesting colours. Some cow horn can be as black as buffalo, but these ones look pretty colourful. 
I've already drilled a conical hole with a half inch opening at about one and a half inches of depth into the top and bottom knocks. This larger piece of horn will form the top knock. Make sure you're putting the correct knock on the relevant limb. Before we shape the wood to fit, let's give ourselves some help by measuring out and marking the centre of the limb. A simple cross or intersecting lines will suffice. The aim is to reduce the tip of the limb so it forms a perfect cone to match the one in the horn. By keeping an eye on our markings at the end, we can keep the cone of wood as even and as straight as we can so our knock eventually sits aligned with the rest of the bow limb. Periodically check your marking to make sure that you're keeping the cone central. The method I'm using here is to turn the bow stave with one hand and keep even strokes with the rasp in the other. Once you get close to a decent cone shape, offer up the knock and see how the fit is doing. By holding the tip of the horn and moving it, I can see and feel there is movement at the opening of the horn meaning the horn is not sitting far enough down the cone of wood, so removing wood from the tip of the cone should help. There we are, a much better fit. Not surprisingly, the process for the bottom knock is much the same. We've made our centre marking and can begin the removal of wood. Offering up the horn presents us with a puzzle. I'm unsure this time where the proud spot of wood is as the movement is less pronounced. A handy hint is to push and twist the horn onto the bow to leave a mark where to remove wood. Now we have a nice fit on both knocks, it's time to get them glued on. We use and recommend a two-part epoxy. Spread the glue evenly onto the cone and into the socket of the horn. Using a pointed piece of wood helps you get the glue down into the end of the hole. Once you're happy with the amount of glue applied, offer up the horn to the bow. Using a similar method mentioned earlier, push and twist the horn with one hand whilst holding and twisting the bow with the other. Eventually you will get out all the air bubbles that are trying to pop the horn off the end of the bow. Before the glue sets, and we're using a rapid setting version of the two-part epoxy here, make sure the knock is on straight by putting the stave onto your shoulder and looking down the length of the bow at the knock. Make sure the knock tip is pointed towards the back of the bow. When leaving the glue to set overnight, make sure you place the bow with the knocks pointed down or you'll find that they twist round as the glue sets. By the magic of editing, you join me the next day when the glue has had 24 hours to completely cure. I'm using a small bandsaw to help speed up the process of removing excess horn. You can do this by hand or any method you wish. Be careful as one slip could go down to the wood. If you're unconfident, stick to the hand rasping I'm about to show you.
With the bow safely clamped to the bench, I can use both hands on the rasp for extra control as I start to shape the horn. The more control you have, the less likely you are to cut into the wood of the stave below the knock we just glued on, or indeed cut too deeply into the horn and into the cone we shaped underneath. As you have probably gathered, as we are only 6 minutes into a 30 minute video, Horn knocks are a huge amount of work. This is partly because we're making a Victorian longbow and their bows had elaborately carved knocks. Also, there are several very important aspects and functions of the horn knocks that amateur bowyers often neglect. Hopefully, after watching this video, you will understand a great deal more about the art and the function of longbow knocks. As you may be able to see, I've moved over to using a half round rasp to carve out the main dipped central section of our knock. It's a much narrower tool and allows for greater control of the finer work we're doing now that most of the thickness of the horn has gone. Whatever shape or style you go for, keep it in mind as you work on the horn. A good mental picture will help guide you. Also, bear in mind we're trying to get the knock to align to the rest of the bow once braced and drawn. Make sure you leave your horn oversized before putting in the grooves for the string. That way, once braced, you'll have plenty of horn to remove from one side or the other to make it straight with the bow limbs. The shaping process is much the same for the bottom knock. Again following on from the Victorian pattern, the bottom knock is a smaller and shorter knock as it's likely to take more abuse, being lent on the ground as archers stand around talking to each other between ends. It still has the curved shape to allow for a stringer, but without the need for a second groove. Now we've got the basic knock shape, we can brace the bow and work on finalising any alignment issues, taking some horn off one side or the other to make sure that they're nice and straight. We're going to put some initial grooves into the knock, about an inch up from the socket end at the high point that I've left, before the shape drops into the dip of the bracing area. I'm using a rat tail rasp to make a small initial groove. I won't do a fully shaped groove until I've braced up the bow and seen where the string wants to lie. The groove I have made will be enough to hold the bow braced so we can mark the string position. 
As you can see, our dipped shape will allow for easy bracing with a simple bracing cord without resorting to an unnecessary second groove. Tie the knot of the bracing cord correctly and it will sit against the bulbous part of the knock and won't slip down to displace the bowstring from its groove. The bracing method consists of placing your foot onto the bracing cord and one hand on the handle with the belly of the bow facing down. Now carefully stand to a near upright position to bend the bow. With your spare hand, reach out along the top limb to slip the loop into the knock groove. To unbrace, simply pull up on the bow and remove the loop. With our bow braced, we can get a better look at how it sits on the limbs, allowing us to make adjustments. But let's finish our grooves first. Get a pencil and mark where the string wants to lie. Not forgetting that the bottom knock string position will look very different to the top. With our pencil lines for guidance, we can start making our final string grooves. Again I'm starting with the rat tail rasp, a tool we hope to have in our catalogue soon. I can't stress enough how much care you should take at this point. Slipping with a sharp tool this near to the wooden part of the bow can cause some problems. You also don't want to get the grooves wrong, as you'll have very little room on the nearly finished knocks to make up for any mistakes. The majority of the work here is to follow the pencil lines, but ultimately I want a nice rounded groove, deep enough for the string not to pop out during use, and for the string to sit in its natural position once braced. After the initial cut with the rasp, it's time to widen that groove with a round file, making it a more suitable size to accommodate the style of laid-in loop that we use. The file will also smooth out the area so as not to damage the string. The method of cutting the groove doesn't change for the bottom knock, but the overall shape of the groove does, as the bottom knock has to accommodate the bowyer's knot. This goes full circle around the knock, so our groove will meet up at the back to form one looped groove.
Our final grooves are complete. We can now work on finishing the shaping and carving of the knocks. I'm starting with a flat rasp again to even up the sides, now that I can see where the knock is sitting after bracing. I may occasionally re-brace the bow to keep a check on the alignment as I go. A design and function of the top knock that I often see people getting wrong is the socket section. The even continuation from the bow limb into the horn, particularly running from the back of the bow as this is where the string needs to slide effortlessly along when bracing to get that loop into the groove. Make the change from bow into knock as seamless as possible.
that's pretty much the shape of the top knock finished. I'm also happy with the bottom knock, its robust shape and some nice colours have come through. Next I'm going to sand off the sharp edges of the grooves. As the string is going to do a fair bit of moving around, you'll need to get rid of anything that could damage it over time. Once I'm done with the sanding, I can move over to using the cabinet scraper. The grain of the horn, so to speak, can go in many directions, so you'll need to try many methods to get the best results. You should start to see an almost see-through opaqueness of the horn and its colours at this point. It's usually down to luck as to how the cow horn will come out. Sometimes you get wonderful patterns and mixes of colours, sometimes just plain black. I'm quite pleased with this one. I've got the fade out between the wood and the horn almost seamless. Thanks for watching this video. Please give us a like and subscribe if you're into this sort of thing. This has taken several weeks of my life to put together, so if you want more of these sorts of videos, please check out our donation button below and in the comments. See you next time for part four of Making a Longbow. You join us for part four of how to make a longbow. It's time to fit an arrow plate. This prevents arrows wearing a groove in the wood. We're using mother of pearl, mainly composed of calcium carbonate and produced by mollusks to protect its interior tissue. We cut a piece just over one centimeter wide and around two and a half centimeters long. Obviously, any shape can be fitted to suit your taste or skill level. You can shape the piece by hand, or if you want to speed up the process, you can use a grinder as shown here. Please watch your fingers and definitely wear a mask. Now that we have our finished shape, it's time to find where it's going to sit in the bow. Place an arrow in the bow whilst it's braced, roughly opposite the top of the handle. This will allow us to see where an arrow would actually touch the side of the bow. Mark the bow at the point of contact. This will give us the centre for our plate. Then we can mark the top of the handle with a horizontal line for the bottom of the arrow plate to sit on. Offer up the mother of pearl, placing the bottom on that horizontal line. Continue to draw around the shape of the arrow plate, doing your best to keep it in place as you do so. It's time to remove the wood from within the pencil line we just made. I start with a sharp craft knife. You could also use a Stanley blade or similar. 
as I have a macro lens fitted to my camera, it makes all this work look a lot larger than it does in person. So it's very important to go slowly and have a steady hand whilst doing this process. For those of you who've never done any carving or similar relief work, you may want to practice on a spare piece of wood before risking the bow that you've spent so much time on. Once I've established a deep enough boundary cut, I can start using a small half round chisel to get out a majority of the wood from the centre. Again, I have to be very careful not to slip. I try to work in the direction of the handle, so if I do slip, the mistake is covered by the handle. Slow and steady wins the race. As long as you've done a deep enough boundary cut, you should find the work that we're doing with the chisels goes without an issue. Once the majority of the wood is out, it's time to move over to a smaller chisel for the finer work as we approach the sides of our hole and the awkward pointed section. If you feel you've taken out quite a substantial amount of wood, it's good to check how far you've gone by placing the plate in position to check your progress. The overall fit of the shape is fine, but the plate is still sitting proud, so I need to take out a little bit more depth.
People have often shown concern over the years that putting in an arrow plate would somehow weaken the bow and cause a breakage. Trust me, after 40 years of experience, I've never actually seen a bow break at that point. The plate is only about 2mm thick and it's so near the handle that very little limb movement actually happens at that point. Our fit and depth is now good. Let's get it glued in with some two-part epoxy. After leaving it to set well for 24 hours, we can now get rid of any excess glue and round off the flat edges to match in with the curved shape of the bow. Once finished with the rasp and file, I can move on to using the scraper to get rid of any large tool marks. I won't bother with the sandpaper yet, as the next stage is to sand and finish the bow. If you've been enjoying this series and found it useful, please give us a like. If you'd like to support the work that we're doing, feel free to donate using the thanks button which is just below the video, or our PayPal donate which you'll find in the comments and description box. See you for part 5 of How to Make a Longbow. Welcome to part 5 of How to Make a Longbow. Today we're looking at some final tillering and the finishing processes such as sanding, checking the weight of the bow, stamping on some measurement details and polishing those knocks. Now that we've got the horn knocks on, uh, which means I've reduced now these tips which were stiff prior to putting on those knocks, we're obviously going to get a different overall shape because of the more movement that we're getting at either end. The amount I usually leave is probably, let's say, a foot. So I've, I've, I've made a change to this bow at least by a foot on each end of the tips. Let's draw it up now and see what we're getting.
Okay, I've still got a flat spot somewhere around here. So I'm going to take a look at that and uh, get it back up on the tiller after that. Okay, we're back up on the tiller. So I've removed some from around this area here, which is slightly flat. Let's draw a good few pulls and uh, see if it makes any difference. In case anyone's wondering where I've actually got the hook on the string there, the knocking point is not correct. This is just a tillering string, it's just a string I use for this purpose, so uh, don't worry about where I've placed the hook. Okay, what do we think folks? Has that made some difference? I think it has. It's looking a lot better shape now. Okay, I'm going to check the measurements and see what the distances are between the limbs and see what we think. I've done the measurements now and by measurements I mean by going out a certain distance from the top and bottom of the handle. In this case I went out about 8 inches and then measured from that point to the string and the measurements are correct and correct I mean that the top limb is about 2 eighths of an inch d deeper here than it is here because of the length of the top limb, the top limb therefore bends slightly more to accommodate that difference in the length. So we've got a two eighths inch of an inch, two eighths of an inch difference here compared to here. Um, those measurements you could do six inches out, eight inches out and 12 inches out so just to make sure that it's the same throughout the length of the limbs. Okay, let's draw it up now and see how it's starting to look. Okay, I'm happy in general with how this is looking now, and as I say, the measurements are correct. I'm going to do a bit of fiddling around with the tiller off camera, just to do a little bit here and there, just until I'm super happy, and obviously it will depend on whether this is coming out to the desired weight to compare to the draw length that I'm after. Um, one of the reasons I'm going to be doing it off camera is because I obviously you can't see the setup that I've got here but I've set the camera up in the position that I would normally stand in to show you exactly what I would be looking at when I'm tillering which does mean uh, the entire time I've been making this bow I'm making it by looking at a two inch by two inch little screen which uh, is not that easy so I'm going to do a bit of the final tillering on my own to my heart's content without your prying eyes and without this blooming camera being in the way. After checking the tiller I can move on to finishing the bow starting with a smooth cut file to get rid of any larger marks or ridges that might have been caused by other tools. I use long strokes to avoid creating dips and use minimal pressure, being mindful of that D-shaped curve of the limbs. Then I can move on to using the scraper used correctly and carefully, you can remove any heavy to medium marks that are left. Then comes the exciting part. Anyone who's worked with wood will know the tedious yet necessary process of sanding. 
and it's no different here. Lots of elbow grease and finer and finer levels of grit until you're using the finest sandpaper you have. And eventually you should be able to only see the grain of the wood as you can see here in these very close-up pictures. Obviously the more you sand the bow the less weight you'll end up with, so at some point you'll need to get the bow back on the tiller and check the weight. Richard's using an electronic scale here, but any kind will do. The advantage with this one over a mechanical one is it will display the highest weight it got to during the pulling and remain on the screen as you walk back to the tiller. As it's come out at £36, we'll mark the bow at 35 as it will lose a pound or so during its first initial use when in the hands of the customer. We use metal number stamps to mark our bows. You can, of course, use any method that you like. On a longbow, we tend to mark the draw length, which is the draw length of the customer and the draw length to which the bow has been made for. We also mark the weight at that draw length. As we make bows for a living, we also use a serial number, which consists of the date of construction and the number of bows since we started keeping a record of bows produced. Traditionally, Victorian longbows have a distinct handle section. To make them more comfortable, small pieces of wood were glued to the back and sides that were then shaped before applying the wrapping, making for a more comfortable feel in the hand. The pieces of wood do pop off over time and can cause our customers some concern as the bow starts to make creaking noises from the handle section. To get round this, we use some two-part filler that you may use on a car. Once dried, it can be shaped to suit the hand. This is our branding iron stamp, which consists of the RH logo. We heat it up in a gas flame and very carefully place it on the back of the bow. And if we're lucky, it should come out okay. Now we've done all the marking that we need to, it's time to varnish the limbs. We recommend using a cloth dipped into varnish and then applied in consistent strokes. Check for excess varnish runs as you go, as these can be difficult to rectify once dry. We tend to apply at least two coats and allow a day's drying in between. Once you're happy with your varnish finish, it's time to polish the knocks. We use a car rubbing compound, such as T-Cut or similar brands. Metal polishing compounds also work, such as Brasso. Carefully secure the bow, apply the product to the cloth, and begin rubbing as shown. Some people favour a polishing wheel attached to an electric drill, but if you do go down this route, I suggest protecting the wooden limbs. It's now that you get to see the true beauty of your work. That's it for part 5. Like, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can join us for the final part of how to make a longbow. Thanks for watching and happy bow making.
Hello folks and welcome to another Richard Head Longbows video. In fact the last one, well not the last ever one, don't get too frightened, but the last one of this series of videos where we've been making this triple laminate Victorian English longbow. This is part five or six, I can't remember where we're up to, but as I say, it's the last one. If you've come to this one first and you're wondering why you're seeing the last one, you may want to click on the link above, which will take you to the first in the series of videos. And also below this video is the hopefully the complete list and links to all the other videos, which as I say, amount to about five or six different videos in making this bow. Thank you very much to um, our subscribers and to some wonderful donators, if that's a real word, who donated via, via our PayPal donate button, which is on the banner at the top of our YouTube channel. And it's in the details below this video, along with the links to all the other parts of the videos. Thank you to them for making um, donations and making these videos possible. They take us months to make these types of videos where we're doing a long series like this. Um, if you want us to continue doing these sort of long-winded bow making series of videos, um, consider donating. Uh, it takes us a lot of time out of the workshop to make this sort of thing and edit them together. If you've got any idea about making videos or editing, you'll know how long it takes to make these sorts of things. And uh, yeah, if you don't, well, then we aren't going to be able to make these sorts of videos and it'll be just some smaller silly ones that we've got time to do when we've got nothing better to do. We like those. Eh? Yeah, we like the silly ones occasionally. So yes, we're here, we're here to help you make bows and arrows with our million years of knowledge and expertise and also yeah, a bit of fun along the way. Uh, the reason I've got Richard here today is because he's going to be doing the last part of this particular bow. The easy bit. The easy bit, which is putting on the handle. And it's going to be much easier for me to be able to operate the camera and film someone else doing this fiddly job rather than trying to do it myself. All the other videos that you've seen have all been me filming myself, making it. Well, this is going to make it a lot easier having Richard here. He just happens to be visiting. So it's going to be a lot easier for me. Maybe not so easy for you, but a lot easier for me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, what is this final process? What is the handle? We've got to put the handle on and hopefully in one of the previous videos we've shown that we've actually built up the yes. handle a little, little bit. Yeah. A lot of people making bows don't bother with that. It's just the square section just rounded off a little bit, which is okay, but we're copying what the Victorians did and we're making uh, not exact copies, but we're basing our bows on the Victorian sporting bow that was used by ladies and gentlemen. So they wanted a slightly nicer handle to, to hold on to. So we've done that. We've put a bit of masking tape on and I'm going to glue on the handle material. Now I've got a bow here. I'll just reach around and get it. Okay. Oh, this is a Which real, is real Victorian a one. Victorian oh. bow. And the handle on this is velvet. Uh, we, we, we mainly now use uh, a braid or a leather. They used velvet, nice and comfortable, and also along the top and bottom, uh, a gold leaf leather strip, which is what we do. And we've had gold leaf uh, pieces made, which are like, like these, and these will go round the top and bottom of our, our handles. So uh, this particular bow, if you're interested, it's it's you, the belly is you, and it's backed with a thin layer of you sapwood. So you've got you heartwood and you sapwood. And the sapwood, um, they haven't bothered to follow the line of the grain. Um, there's quite short grain section there, if you can see, see that. Um, but looking at the arrow plate, and there's a mother of pearl arrow plate set in, which is what we do. You can feel a groove in that arrow plate. So this bow has shot an awful lot of arrows without any problems. Uh, so that's the sort of handle we're going to do. If I can have the bow back a minute. So what we will do, if we were going to put a leather handle on this one, and we do give people the choice when we're making a bow. So we would have the leather around the handle like that and then our gold leaf strip top and bottom because the rules for a long bow is that you should have no arrow rest it's got to be shot off the hand so your hand is there there's no ridge or ledge to um, 
support the arrow. So when you put the arrow in the bow like this, it's actually resting on your hand. So when you hold the bow, you've got to make sure that your hand is in exactly the same place every time. So nothing to support the arrow. Now what some people are doing, if you take the leather strip back a minute and the arrow, hold the arrow for me please, is actually with the leather bending it over and like that. So the handle, as you can see that, it forms a bit of a ridge, if I can have the arrow again, which if you're vertical doesn't actually support the bow but it gives a definite position of where the arrow is. If you're canting the bow over it would almost support the arrow and in fact the National Field Archery Society had to bring in a rule to make sure that that wasn't so thick that when the bow is held vertically it holds the arrow on. Um, a lot of people field shooting cant the bow and it would hold it so I'm not sure the rule is tight as it should be. Um, I have had and hold the arrow again please a one of the really quite top top archers who made his own bows were using thick leather almost like a belt leather around the handle and that certainly was forming an arrow rest so you've got no problem with your hand being in different positions it gives a definite position of where your hand um so that was that was outlawed but it just shows that people are bending the rules just a little bit to get that slight advantage but we're making them as they were originally so shot off the hand no question about uh, having any support for the arrow right i'm now going to put the bow on the bench get the handle material to hand glue on the handle material and the leather trim and finish it off. Great, I'll do the videoing then. Phew. To gauge where we're going to put the braid, we place and mark where the leather trim will sit. Once we've marked top and bottom, we can start gluing the area. We've added some masking tape to aid in adhesion. Any household glue will do, but we're using HMG, which we sell in our shop. After covering the handle in a good amount of glue, we can start positioning the braid. We've cut a slope at one end, which we will trap under the braid as we rotate the handle. A few blobs of glue onto the tucked section will help it all stay together. It's then a case of winding the braid carefully onto the handle. Now we're at the other end of the handle, we can repeat our sloped cut of the braid and tuck the end under the last turn of the material, not forgetting to add some more glue. Then make sure the braid is nice and tight to the handle. It's time to glue on our gold leaf leather trim. We start by wrapping it around to get the approximate length that we need. Then, much as we did with the braid, we run some glue on the handle, including the top of the braid, where we're going to overlap. We also place some glue on the back of the leather, as we're going to use it as a contact adhesive this time. With both surfaces glued, we need to wait a few minutes for it to go tacky before we can place the leather. Being careful to get the leather in the right place, we can begin attaching it to the handle. Once we're happy with the placement of the leather, we can overlap the excess and carefully make a join by cutting with a sharp knife and then butting those two ends together.
Well, there you are. That's how you put a handle onto a longbow, or at least the Victorian style. If you want a more in-depth video on you know, and instructions on how to actually put the handle on, we have done another much longer, more detailed video of this particular process, which I'll put in the description box below. And don't forget, you don't have to do the same type of handle that we're doing here. As Richard mentioned, this is based on Victorian type handles. And it's not to say this is the only type of nope, Victorian cool. handle and also not the only type of handle. So you can do whatever you want. You don't have to don't have to imitate us. That's fine. Um, there's one last thing Richard did to the bow. And what was that? The other end, the knock end, we put a piece of ribbon. There was a hole drilled through the horn knock at the top. Piece of ribbon through, tied off so that the two lengths when you put your bowstring on you can just tie those two round the loop of the string. It stops the string sliding down the bow and when you pull it out of the bow bag your string's down the bottom of the bag and you can't get to it. So it stops the string coming off and it saves you having a string keeper, a separate leather pouch with a hook on the end, saves you having one of those. It's, it's there and on a windy day it'll blow in the wind. You can see which way the wind's blowing. Dual purpose. Exactly. Very handy. Very Till they handy. ban it. Till, yes. <laughs> Till you have to go back to licking, licking your finger and things like that. All those other good longbow things that you've got to do. Well, there we are. Again, I hope you enjoyed watching this series of videos. And if you do want to do more of these sorts of in-depth videos, um, then consider donating. If not, don't worry. I'm sure we will continue to make videos. But uh, yes, much more sporadic and when we've and got daft the time. Ones. And we um, like the daft ones. Yeah, if, if you don't want us to do these videos, <laughs> all you've got to do is say no, and we will just make daft ones from now on that will annoy you. Uh, so it's your choice. And uh, some of the other things that we have got coming up are reviews of items from various archery companies and things around the world that sent us stuff to have a look at. So those will be coming up. So yeah, thanks for watching. I hope you did enjoy this series of videos. If you want to watch them all, I will put them below the links to all the different ones. And at some point I may put this all of them into one big mega long video, which should probably come out at about an hour and a half, two hours video um, when I can get round to doing that. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, please do like and subscribe. That really helps us out. Do comment below if there's anything you'd like to see or if you just want to say how wonderful we are or say rude things to us, which some people seem to like to do. And uh, yeah, uh, and check out the website, uh, the bow making website, um, howtomakealongbow.co.uk. He's also in the description and also our website where we sell things. Oh, yeah. When we actually aren't making videos, <laughs> we do make things to sell, oh, yes. including this bow. Um, <laughs> this bow will be on our website for sale. As I say, the link is below, uh, unless, of course, it's already sold. <laughs> Who knows? It might sell the first five minutes this video goes live, or it might be there for five weeks. Um, have a look. You never know. You might get lucky. So, yeah, there's a couple of other videos on the screen and uh, a subscribe button, which is probably covering his face. So please do click that if you haven't already and hit the notification bell, which a lot of people don't know about. So you actually get notified when the new videos come out. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon for more silly bow making videos. <laughs> yeah. Ha, ha, ha.